Um, this is number nine in the Good News series. And um, when I th- prepared this and thought about what a privilege it is, and this morning Sharon and I were praying, and we were praying for the service, and we were praying for the needs of the church and various members of the church and things that they're going through. We just thought how awesome, and you heard me in the, ma- in the prayer this morning, how amazingly awesome it is that we can come into the presence of God himself. I mean, just think about that for a moment, that we, you and I can come and, and meet God in a very personal way, and he can come and speak to us and, and minister to us. This creator that gave us the ability to even be here this morning. Just think, and, and, and I pray that through the message today that we would just get a, a, a real deeper understanding of what it means to really encounter God through prayer. And what a blessing it is that the, we have this good news about prayer. In Matthew's gospel, and I'm going to re- re- it's going to be up on the screen, the Bible says these words, and Jesus is saying to his, his disciples, but um, us as well, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds. To everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you, sinful people, know how to get good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? I want us to specifically, and we're going to think about this for a moment, in verse 7 of, of our passage. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. One of my struggles is that I oftentimes pray, and I don't get the answer immediately. I don't know about you. And God somehow lets me kind of abide, and, and, and He tries my patience, Um, but I've got to hang in there and remember that God is a prayer-answering God, and my timing is not His timing. But I know for a fact, and I believe the Word of God to be true, and I don't just simply ask and just give up, but I keep on asking, I keep on knocking, as the Scripture, as Jesus said over here, we ought to be doing. And don't give up. Well, We need to press in and continue seeking God's face. Some of the best news that we have from the Lord is that we have this privilege of coming into the very presence of God. That you and I can dialogue, that we can have communion with our Heavenly Father. We can have fellowship with God. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's such a blessing and such a privilege that God has afforded to us. Jesus repeatedly taught that it is possible for people to talk to God in prayer. He always he, he, he said, come aside, come pray with me. He invited people to come along and pray with him. He told his disciples to believe that the Heavenly Father was eager to come and encounter them and meet with them. And that same message that he told his disciples is the same message that Jesus would share with you this, this morning. Is come, come into the very presence of God. Come into his, into his awesomeness, into his, into his glory that you and I can go and spend time with him. Jesus spoke of the Father as being both generous and being wise in giving good gifts to those who come to him in prayer. So oftentimes I think we miss out on the things that God has for us because we fail to come to Him in prayer. Most times, and I've met and, 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 and the people that you meet, the only time that we come to God in prayer is when we have some need. And that's not fellowship. That's like having a best friend that we never spend time with. I mean, what kind of a friend would, would, would that be if you never spend time with them? And, 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 and be in fellowship with Him and wanting to hang out with Him. And God's more than our best friend. He's our Heavenly Father, and we can spend this time with Him in His presence. He is more than a best friend. He's our Heavenly Father. In the words of our text this morning, our Lord encourages us to be persistent in our efforts, and that we continue pressing in into God's presence. We must not only seek and search for the gifts of God, because that's important, but it's more than that. But we must also come and seek His guidance, to seek His assistance, to seek out all the mysteries that He wants to reveal to us about His plan for our lives. And we miss out on those things when we don't spend the time with Him. 
if we don't go and spend time in His presence, if we don't come and kneel before Him, and I'm not saying that you have to kneel, but just to be in His presence, perhaps you, you're comfortable of sitting on the side of your bed, or maybe in the living room when it's all quiet, or maybe you have a special place, place where you feel closer to God, that you set yourself aside and you spend this time with God. John Wesley, his wife, now they had many children, and the children would always press in and press in and press in. And, then, and she would just never find the time. So what she would do, she'd go into the kitchen and she would have a prayer covering or like a blanket. And she would just cover her head and block everyone out. And she would spend her time there in the kitchen praying, seeking God's face. She blocked out the world. And folks, don't say that we are so busy that we can't spend time with God. And let me tell you, just a two-minute token prayer is not enough. You've got to spend time. You've got to wait on God and hear from God. He, he wants a, a, a real living, dynamic relationship with us. Jesus gave us the example. Jesus prayed. And if Jesus prayed, how can we then not pray? I mean, if He's the model that we model our lives after, if He's the perfect one, and if He prayed, how much more should you and I be praying? In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, the Bible says, Before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. He separated himself, and he went and sought, and he prayed. Who did he pray to? He prayed to the Father. Then in Luke chapter 5, verse 15, But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. He separated himself, and he went and spent time in the Father's presence. He sought guidance. He had the empowerment of the Father. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. He imagined praying to God all night. How many? Of, when was the last time we spent that amount of time in God's presence? Praying all night. Then in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, And about eight days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and went up to the mountain and prayed. So he took some of his friends with him, and they prayed together. Jesus was modeling a relationship with the Father and how important it was to spend time in God's presence. Folks, we need to come to God. If we call ourselves Christians and we call ourselves followers of God, and we call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ, and he's the one that we say we follow, how can we not then be spending more time with God? In Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 45, it says, And he walked away about a stone's throw. This is when he was in the garden of Gethsemane during his passion. He knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops. Of blood. Can you, can you feel the intensity of Christ's prayer there in the garden? And at last he stood up again and he returned to the disciples only to find them asleep and exhausted from grief. When the Lord looks at us and he desires us to spend time in his presence, how does he see us? Does he see us exhausted? Does he see us exhausted from grief? Does he see us exhausted from the things of this world? Does he see us exhausted, just so burnt out that we don't even have the desire to be praying? Folks, stop for a moment. Be refreshed, because the only place where we find refreshment of our souls and our spirits is as we spend time in the very presence of Jesus. We find ourselves burnt out so often as because we fail in that area of our lives. One of the hardest ministries in any church, and I've spoken to many, many pastors, is the ministry of prayer, of coming together corporately and just being in the very presence of Jesus. You know, oftentimes we think that we, when we come together, that we each must pray, and that this, sometimes it's just good just to sit and wait on God. But because we live where we live, I guess, because everything's like instant, and you press this button, and it's there, and bang, bang, we think God ought to be the same. But God's not like that. We need to come to Him in prayer, seeking His face. Prayer permeated every aspect of the Lord's life. It saturated His life. He had such a connection with the Father. He faced at the close of His ministry, when we see right here in the Garden of, of, of Gethsemane, we see that His ministry was coming to a conclusion. And yet there he, we see Him again, praying to the Father. 
While on the cross, he communed with the Father. You see the words of Jesus as he was suspended between heaven and earth, talking to the Father, having this dialogue with the Father going on, even in the midst of this great tragedy. But our redemption was won on the cross of Calvary. Even though at that particular time it seemed like the end had come, Jesus knew that it was just the beginning. And so we celebrate that this morning. The Lord's presence ministry today can be described in terms of our intercessory prayer as we pray for one another, as we intercede for one another, as we uplift one another before the Lord. When we are made aware through the prayer chain, there's a prayer request. Stop right there and then and pray for that need. Don't just say, oh, there's another prayer text and just delete it. No, stop for a moment. Just uplift that need before the Lord. Imagine if all of all the people, and I'm not sure, Bob, there's probably 150 people on that prayer list, maybe more. Oh, 100. But imagine if right there and then 100 prayers just enter into the very presence of Jesus. Right there and then. That's like continuously asking. It's like the Lord's heard that 100 times. Bang, just like that. And, 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 and the Lord doesn't just need 100 prayers. He needs thousands. He wants to fellowship with his creation. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, the, bio, the, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to what? To intercede with God on their behalf. In other words, the Lord is interceding. And intercession is that he's praying for you and I. He's bringing us before the Father. He's interceding for your needs, my needs, our needs together as a community of faith. The second thing that the Lord did, our Lord encouraged you and I who are his followers to pray. Not only did Jesus model prayer, but he told us to pray. You see, for the Christian, it's not optional. We cannot be a follower of Jesus if we don't pray. Then you're just fooling yourself. You're living in a fool's paradise, to tell you the truth, if you do not pray. You must pray. You must commune with the Father. You must talk to the Lord. The Lord assumed that all his followers would pray. He assumed his disciples would pray. It was just a given. It wasn't even something to, 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 to teach on. He just said, when you pray, this is how you ought to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, he says, And when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Your Father who sees everything will reward you. Jesus didn't say, hey, guys, I think you should pray. He says, when you pray. He just presumed. I mean, and it wasn't presumptuous of him. It was just a thing that his followers did. They prayed. And let me tell you, when you pray, your life changes. You are impacted. The Holy Spirit does such a work in your life. You might be so down in the dumps, but when you get up from a place of prayer and communion with God, your spirit is lifted. You feel like you can walk on clouds almost. It's like God shows up and He does something in your life when you pray. But when we fail to pray, we remain in that, in that, that deep, dark place, oftentimes called maybe even depression. God helps us in whatever need you may have, whatever you might be going through. Whatever difficulty you may face today or tomorrow, Jesus is there and we have this privilege of coming to Him. Every time Sharon and I pray in the morning and we finish praying, we, she, Sharon may wake up and she says, yeah, I'm really down this morning. I say, come, let's pray. We pray and bang. She says, we, you know, we get up from the place of prayer and, and our life is different. She says, man, this morning she said it. Don't you feel like light? I said, yeah, because we've been in the presence of Jesus. We brought our needs and the burdens before the Lord. But during the course of the day, we have all the things that, that penetrate our lives and impact our lives, and we start bearing them ourselves. And we need to come to Jesus who comes alongside of us, and we can spill our guts before Him. All Christians should be praying on a regular basis, individually, but as well as corporately. When we get together, spend time with the Lord. In a Bible study, spend time together in prayer. Sometimes that's the most difficult time. It's like pulling rocking horse teeth. It's impossible. People just don't want to spend time. But when you realize the privilege of what it is to come and pray and to be in the presence of Jesus, something dynamically changed. Some of us feel, well, my, my, my language might not be adequate. God hears your heart before He hears the very words that you express. He knows what you're going through. The Spirit of God knows that. And you don't have to be embarrassed or anything. Just spill your guts before God. And that's what God appreciates. He 
you can't, you can't fool him. You know, you can speak eloquently or whatever the case may be. He's, he's not impressed by that. Nothing but what he loves is a heart that is broken and contrite and, and humble before him, that comes to him and acknowledges who he is and our relationship one with him. That's what God desires. He wants that connection with us. Private prayer enables you and I as believers to pour our hearts before God, expressing our true needs and our true feelings in the quietness we wait and let God come and answer and minister to us. I believe that Jesus made the assumption that all people were to pray because he knew the great enemy that's always about. You and I face a spiritual turmoil and a battle every single day of our lives. You may not even be cognizant of it, but right now there's a battle raging for your soul in the heavenlies. And God sent the angels and God sent the Holy Spirit into your life and the guardian angels to do that battle. Remember Daniel, how he prayed and how he sought, and there was a battle that was raging up in the heavens. This is what goes on. Even when you pray, sometimes you battle to, to get into contact with God. Well, there's a spiritual battle going on. This, uh, the enemy doesn't want you to be in contact with the Father. He knows that, that when you spend time in God's presence, something's going to change in your life and you're going to become a powerful, impactful believer. He doesn't want that for you. He wants you to be weak. He wants to destroy you. He wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you in the mire. But God wants to lift you up out of that. And he wants to put your feet on the solid rock as we spend time on him to be victorious, to be impactful in the world that you and I live in. Our Lord instructed his disciples in a proper manner of effective prayer. He gave them the model prayer. We often call that the Lord's Prayer or in some denominations you would call it the Our Father. But we find it in Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13. We can recite that. You've learned it as perhaps growing up in Sunday school. If not, if you don't know it and you don't know it verbatim, go back and maybe learn to recite it. But don't just recite it just because it's something that you've learned. But think about every single paragraph, every single little sentence that's in the Lord's Prayer. And you think about that and you expand on it. Our Father, when you think about that, our Father. He's not just my Father, but He's our Father collectively. That we can come to Him as a body of Christ seeking God. Where is He? Who's in heaven? Glory to your name, hallowed be your... And so you go through the Lord's Prayer, reciting that, but thinking about every aspect. It's not that we pray that prayer. That is a model prayer that we model our prayers after. And we pray for the needs of people. We pray that, that God would set us free from the enemy's um, 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 impact upon our lives, that he would take care of our needs and those around us. Jesus reminded them that when they prayed, that they should address their prayers to God as their heavenly Father, rather than just a creator of the universe. As many people, oh, He's just a creator. And it seems like God is so distant when we talk to Him like that. But He's our Father. And there's a personal contact that Jesus was impacting and telling us. When you pray, say, Our Father, Our Father. Our Father. He's our Father. And some of us may have a picture of a dad. Maybe that wasn't that great. Don't let that distort your view of our Heavenly Father. Because God loves you so, so much. He reminded them of the parent-child relationship that exists between the believer and God the Father. Our Lord urged His disciples to avoid some erroneous teachings concerning prayer. Because there were a lot of things going on, even in Christ's time, concerning prayer that, that, that weren't correct, that, that, were, that were incorrect. And Jesus had to teach His disciples. And Jesus said this in Matthew 6, verse 5, And when you pray, don't be like hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. That's all the reward that they will ever get. Now think about that for a moment. You've been in situations where people, and you've been, maybe even been in prayer meetings, where people brag on themselves, right, through the guise of prayer. Or they confess other people's sin through the guise of prayer. How do you think the Father feels about that? Oh Lord, we pray for... Harry, you know, he's got this huge drinking problem, and man, we just want to uplift him before you. You know, he beat his wife up the other day, and then he, he, he attacked his children, and he got to the job, and he beat his boss up, and oh, God, help all Harry. Oh, what, what kind of prayer is that? Confessing another person's problems. 
pray for Harry that the Lord will undertake in his life. But you don't have to confess all the things that they're going through. God knows that. And he knows deep down in our heart. Pray for Harry that he finds Jesus. That's how we ought to pray. Lord Jesus, we have lived Harry, before you, oh God, that you would do a great work in his life, that he would fall in love with you, Lord Jesus, that he would come to know you and follow hard after you. Wouldn't that be a better prayer? I think so. And so when we come to him, we, we come, and Jesus says, and when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think that their prayers are answered merely by repeating words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need, even before you pray them. Now, I grew up in a certain denomination, and there were certain prayers that when we sat down at a meal, it was almost like rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Um, and, it was, it, and it was so, it was just, it was such a ritual. And it meant nothing. It's just, okay, done. Now we eat. But then when my dad found the Lord, and my mom found the Lord, my brother found the Lord, Suddenly that prayer wasn't just that kind of like without prayer, but it was, it was actually communicating with God, and it, it took on such a different meaning, such a significant meaning. And sometimes you'll pray with your kids, lay me down to sleep, and blah, blah, blah. But, but why don't you pray for your children in a real way, and connect with God, and talk to Him, and, and, and intercede, and ask God's protection upon them, and ask God to, to watch over them during the course of the night, and to guard their hearts, and to guard their minds. Pray for your spouse while they're at work. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Ask how the day was, and as you communicate with one another, you can bring those things before the Lord, that you uplift one another. That's what prayer is, is intercession. We intercede for one another. We don't just use repetitious words. We mean business when we come to God and we pray what the Spirit lays in our heart. He taught His disciples to pray by His example. He taught by His parables and specific instructions. He declared that the Father is a prayer-answering God. That we can come to Him and He answers. He hears our prayer and He answers those prayers. He affirmed that the heart of every single person, every single human being, has the capacity to touch the heart of God, to communicate with God, to be in contact with God. Every single human being has that ability. He declared that it is possible to receive blessings as a result of prayer. That when we're in the very presence of Jesus, God blesses us. He pours His life into us as we spend time in His presence. You see, prayer is richly rewarding. Not only did Jesus model prayer, not only did he teach his disciples to pray, to, to pray, but he showed us that prayer is rewarding. He said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, he adds this, will reward you. Now, this is Jesus saying, and Jesus could never tell a lie. And so when, the, when Jesus said, and your Father who sees you will reward you, when you come and pray and you seek God's presence, it be an expectant belief and say, okay, God, the Word says that when I come to you, Lord, you will reward me. I'm not sure exactly what that reward would be for you, because each one of us is unique and individual. But expect, come to God with an expectancy. That reward might be that He answers your prayer right there and then. Or it might be that He does something and He causes circumstances to change in your life. When Sharon and I finished praying this morning, the reward was we just I felt uplifted and it was just a fresh breeze that seemed to blow. And it wasn't because the windows were open, but it was because God showed up. You and I, we can experience... That nearness of God, when you come into His presence, when you pray, that just imagine that's why I can't, I, this is so impactful in my life, is that when we pray, we know God is there. And we can experience His presence. It's almost like when you sit in the presence of Jesus, you can almost sense His arm around you. I, I, and it sounds hokey, but, but it's really not, because His presence is there and it envelops you. The love of the Father envelops you. Because he loves us so much. And his heart burns and desires us to spend time with him. In James chapter 4 verse 8, the Bible says, and he wrote, Come close to God and God will come close to you. 
Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Sometimes it's like that, isn't it? We want, and we want to know God, but our loyalty is, is split because we want the things of the world as well. And so we're straddling the fence. We've got one foot in the kingdom and like one foot in the world. God says, get, put both feet into the kingdom. Live for me, and then I can bless you, and you can, I, I can do things in your life. But when we straddle the fence, it's like we, we wishy-washy, we go back and forth, and we vacillate between serving God, and then we're in the world. And then we're serving God, and we're in the world. Make a decision and a determination in your life. And say, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Young people, when you get married and you find your, the, the, the one that you want to spend the rest of your life for, can you say that? As for me and my new house, we will serve the Lord. Wouldn't that be tremendous? For those of you that are married and you've been married for some time or whatever the case may be, make that commitment to the Lord. We will serve God as much as we can and, and to the very best of our abilities. Don't do it half-heartedly, but do it wholeheartedly in serving God. The heart of the child of God hungers for God, hungers for the, an awareness of God, for the very presence of God, from the for the assurance that God loves them. There's nothing greater to know that you're loved, isn't it? There's nothing greater to know that you're loved by God, that He cares for each one of you, that He cares for every single human being. Scripture and the experience, our experience, testify to the fact that God is alive. The experience that you have when you're in the presence of Jesus and, you, and once you've finished your prayer and you say amen and so let it be, Lord. That amen is, is so let it be, oh God. Every time you say that, it's reaffirming what you've just prayed for, what you've just brought before the Lord. We become aware of God's precious abiding presence as we seek Him in the closet. As in, in, in the closet of our, uh, the, the, the prayer closet where we go and spend. You may have seen that movie recently. I don't know what it was called again. But here where there was this woman and she had this place of prayer where she would, on the walls and on papers, have all the prayer requests and she would come and intercede for all the needs of her friends and her family. Wouldn't that be great that you find a place where you can just do that and just seek and pray and seek God's face and pour your life out before Him? He knows your life anyway, but he wants you to talk to him. And so he can talk back to you. Because oftentimes prayer for the Christian is just a monologue. God seeks dialogue because he wants to speak to us as much as we want to speak to him. And sometimes you've got to be quiet in the very presence of Jesus. There's an assurance that, that, that God comes and helps us as we pray. For all those who pray. pray. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, And so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings as we do, yet he did not sin. And so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. We will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Isn't that an awesome promise? When we come to the throne room of God, there we will find grace and mercy. If we don't go there, how can we expect to receive grace and mercy if we don't go there? We have to come into the presence of God. There we receive His grace. There we receive His mercy and all the help that we could ever want from the heart of God, from the very hands of God. All of us have needs. All of us have needs that only God can meet. There's, uh, there's some needs that it is impossible for man to undertake. Only God can do it. And isn't it amazing and how awesome and how wonderful it is when we see the hand of God moving in our lives or in the lives of those that we've been praying for? Each of us, as we come to God, we, we have these things that, that want to distract us from God. Set those things aside. Write it down on a piece of paper and push it aside that we can focus on God. It's just simple tools that we can do. Because there's all these things that flood into your mind. Just clear your mind that you can spend time in the very presence of Jesus. The writer of the book of Hebrews encourages us to give ourselves to prayer on a regular basis. And on the basis that we have a God who's sympathetic to our call. That who cares about us. Who knows about us. 
and yet was tempted in all the same ways that you and I are tempted. Jesus went through a tremendous time of persecution and mocking and scourging, not only just the passion of Christ, but everything that he went through, the rejection. He knows what you and I go through. He relates to us. It's not that he's foreign to us. He encourages us to come boldly to the throne room of grace. There we will obtain mercy and grace in a time of need. And it's amazingly encouraging to know that you and I have the privilege of approaching the throne of grace. I want you to get that this morning. What a privilege it is that you and I can come to the throne room of God. That we can come into the very presence of God. We're to receive mercy to receive His grace, to receive His forgiveness, to receive His restoration, His healing, His touch, to find encouragement. And through prayer and confession, we receive the blessing of divine cleansing. We receive the blessing of, 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 of being washed and being, and being forgiven of everything that we ever could have done. That's what God does in the life of His children. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, John writes these words, But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from some wickedness, from all wickedness. Isn't that amazing? That's the kind of God who's so merciful and so gracious to us that when we come to Him, admitting our need, and admitting our error, admitting our sin, and we confess it to Him, don't confess your sin to me, I can't forgive you. Unless you've stolen five bucks out of my wallet, and then you say, Steve, here's the five bucks back, and then I can forgive you. But, if you. but God forgives us. He's the one that forgives us. And it's only He who has the ability to forgive us. When someone wrongs one another, yeah, we can forgive one another. But God forgives sin, and only He can forgive sin. And Jesus modeled an exemplary life before his disciples. He was perfect in all his ways. But at the same time, he encouraged them to confess their sins day by day on a continuous basis that they could receive the forgiveness. Sharon and I had this dialogue the other day. We were speaking, how come the disciples were so impactful? And Sharon's words were, it's because they were holy. Because they lived the life of confession. They lived the life of continuously being cleansed by the Spirit of God, the washing. You see, when we have stuff in our lives that, that is contrary to the nature of God and what God desires, we're building up barriers between the, the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we need to keep that list, that, that stuff short, and get rid of it, all the stuff that is a hindrance in our prayer life, that we have this clear communication between God. And that's when God can use us. It's the only way He can use us, is if we spend time in His presence. An awareness of unconfessed sin causes us as believers to lose the joy of the Lord, to use that joy of, 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 of salvation that we once experienced. And the absence of this joy deprives us from our sweet communion and testimony that Jesus wants to pour into our lives when we fail to pray, when we fail to confess our sins. Forgiveness and full restoration of fellowship with God is possible as we confess our sins before Him. Jesus will cleanse us. He will wash us from every stain of sin. That old hymn, washed in the blood, power in the blood, as He washes us and cleanses us from everything that would be hindering our relationship with Him. The gift of the fullness of the Holy Spirit is one of the great gifts that God uses and gives to those who seek Him. If we're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, perhaps we're not spending enough time in the very presence of Jesus. But once you spend time in the presence of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit can move in you and move through every area of your life, through your language, through the way you communicate, through your fellowship, through whatever it might be as we allow Him in our presence. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, again, I want to repeat this. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Some of us, we have the Holy Spirit. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt you. You can't be born again apart from the Holy Spirit. But some of us, the Holy Spirit only has maybe the hand or the leg or only half of us. He wants all of us. And so we ask for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Some would call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some would call it perfect love. 
I call it the fullness of the Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we are immersed and we are saturated with the very presence of God in our lives, that He flows through every aspect of our lives, that there's not areas in our life where we've put a, a, a sign to Him and said, Lord, you can have everything except this area of my life. God wants every part of your life. And He wants to use you in every aspect of your life. But it only happens as we spend time in His presence. And the Holy Spirit who lives within you starts revealing aspects of your life. And, and as He does, and He shines His spotlight in there, you can confess it to Him and receive the forgiveness. Lord, forgive me of that word I used the other day. Lord, forgive me for that bad thought I had that other day. Lord, forgive me for, for just not being holy in Your presence. Lord, forgive me. And you know what? As you ask for forgiveness... We read that in 1 John 1 verse 9. When we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that amazing? That He just cleanses us from everything. And while we pray and release ourselves to God, we become aware of His presence and His power in our lives. The Holy Spirit gives us the guidance and He empowers us to live the life. Even through the complexities of life. God empowers us. He gives us the ability. He comes in all His fullness to all those who come to Him in faith. He leads us and He empowers us. Those who neglect the privilege and the habit of prayer actually grieve God the Holy Spirit. We grieve Him. He wants to do so much in your life, but when you fail to spend time in His presence, we're quenching Him. We're grieving Him. But when we come into His presence, we say, Lord, here I am. I lay myself out just before you. Do with me as you please. That's what pleases God. And oftentimes when we don't do that, we rob ourselves of the blessings that God has for us. But we also rob others of the blessings that God wants to use you for. That you could be a blessing to others. You and I are instruments in God's hands. And this morning as we come to that place where we realize who who. What the place of the importance of prayer and the blessing and the goodness of being able to spend time in God's presence. We can come into the Lord's presence, confess our faith before Him, confess our sins before Him. We can invite Jesus into our hearts again as Master and Lord of every area of our lives. We can only experience God's guidance and help along the road of life as we develop the habit of prayer and the capacity of dialogue. That can only happen as we spend time in God's presence. Don't use the excuse, I'm just so busy, Steve. You don't understand. I do understand. We are all busy. We all got things going on in our lives. But we have to determine in our hearts the most important thing to us, and that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing more that should supersede that. There's nothing more in your life or my life and our life as a community of faith that should be more important than our time in the very presence of Jesus. Nothing is to knowing Him. If we neglect to pray, we deprive ourselves of a divine understanding of all the problems and the opportunities and circumstances that we confront along the way every single day of our lives. It's only as... Have you ever done this? I, I, I'll just throw it out there. You pray in the morning and you spend a wonderful time in God's presence and you go out and you just feel like, hey, I can face the world. And then there might be a morning where you forget to pray and you go out and all hell breaks loose. It's like, what happened? Oh, I didn't spend time with the Lord. There's a lesson there. Spend time with the Lord, right? And that's what we ought to be doing. I'm not saying that you suddenly become immune when you, when you, when you, when you pray. No, because the things of the world and the enemy are still trying to get to us and still trying to discourage us and dissuade us from spending time with God. But we can come to Him every moment of the day and bring all our needs before Him. When we go through a difficult time, and some of you have gone through such difficult times this past week, draw close to Jesus. Just abide in His presence. Let His love envelop you. And as He does, and He puts His arm around you, and He loves on you, you'll feel your spirit lift, and it's going to be okay, because you're in the very presence of Jesus. Much of what is going on in heaven, this very moment, is a spiritual battle for your life for your time that you spend with God. Communicating with God is enjoying His presence. Don't make prayer such a burdensome thing. See it and change your perspective of it. And say, listen, I'm coming into the presence of God Almighty. What an awesome privilege that is. And our communion will be perfect and without limitations and hindrances. 
as we come and we spend time in the very presence of Jesus. If you haven't accepted the Lord or you've kind of drifted away a little bit or you haven't been spending time in, in, in the Lord's presence, Jesus is here and he wants to invite you to come back and to be in fellowship with him, that he can come and talk to you and you with him. It's an open invitation. But he'll only hear you as you are a child of God. And that's where it begins is as you surrender your life to him. God has taken the initiative and is eager to be in communication with you today. But not just today, but from every day. Don't just think Sunday is the day that we pray. We pray every day. And it's not just before a meal or just before we sleep that we pray. We pray in communion with God. Make it a way of life. And when you do that, let me tell you, you're going to feel an impact in your life. You will sense and you will experience God perhaps again for the first time or again a refreshing and a new move of God in your life. But it's up to you. I can't do it for you. All I can do is just share what I did with this morning and to encourage you to come and seek Jesus. Let's pray.